Good morning, you ready? Good morning, yes. All right. So, uh, I'm going to start. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Exhibit 701 and 700 council. I'm going to be handing them. Thank you. I have handed you uh, Exhibit 700 and 701. Those are the two exhibits that contain the text messages between yourself and Alex Woodworth. What I'd like you to do, Ms. McCandless, take a moment and can you show me any texts in there where Alex Woodworth says, love and do as you will, or anything to that effect? No, not in these text messages. And those text messages cover a time period between uh, October of 2017 and the last one being February 23rd of 2018, correct? Correct. We also had some questions. wallet and the center console. Do you recall those? Yes. All right. May I approach your honor? You may. Excuse me, Mr. DeFore, is there an exhibit number for this? What's that? That one is uh, 704 and the other one is 703. Okay, thank you. Yep. Showing you has been marked for identification as exhibit 703. Uh, that is your wallet there on the seat? That is correct. All right. Your Honor, I'd move the admission of Exhibit 703. I'm going to ask to publish it in a moment. Okay. All right. Exhibit 703 will be received. And Exhibit 704, that is your center console in your car, correct? Correct. All right. Move the admission of Exhibit 704, and I'll ask to publish that one as well. <coughs> Any objection to 704? No. 704 will be received. All right. And I'm also asking to publish 704. All right, you may publish. So we're clear, Ms. McCandless. Better off with the lights on, actually. Thank you. This is your wallet right here, correct? Correct. All right. And then this is your center console, correct? That is correct. Thank you. We had some questions yesterday, uh, and you had testified yesterday about uh, the position you were in uh, when Alex first got into the car. Do you recall that? Yes. All right. And you recall being interviewed on uh, March 23rd, 2018, correct? Or 24th, I'm sorry. I don't have an independent memory of everything I said during those interviews, but okay. yes, I do know I've been interviewed. May I approach your honor? You may. Looking at exhibit 290, page 52, counsel. Can you wait one minute, please? Sure, that's fine. Starting in uh, line uh, 
43, or 2343. Ready? Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you. So I'm uh, showing you, we're starting at line 2343, uh, interviewer two, which was uh, investigator Kaki, states, asks you, describe to me when you were in the back seat prior to him attacking you, so were you, how were you positioned? And your answer is, I was facing down, moving things out of the car to look in my seats and stuff, correct? Yes, that is correct. And you also, yesterday, your statement was that you uh, took the blanket and the pillow out of the car while yes. you were going through things? Yes, that is correct. May I approach again, Your Honor, Council, page 53, starting at line 2392. So then Detective Croc asked you, okay, so then you're in the back. Did you throw anything outside the car when you were digging around for stuff? Your answer is, um, no, I didn't throw anything out. I was just moving things around and stuff, correct? Yes, that is correct. I want to talk to you for a short time about the journals and some of the entries uh, that uh, Alex wrote, okay? All right. May I approach your honor? You may. 697. Which one are you going to? Got a couple questions from the general and then I will tell oh, you. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. I have handed to you what was previously marked and admitted as Exhibit 697. Do you have that? Yes. And that is a document that, or a binder that contains quite a few pages, correct? That is correct. And uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, these are the originals plus typed pages of journal entries, correct? Yes, that is correct. Right. And uh, outside of one that we've talked about uh, in a uh, out of in, in a sidebar, you've read prior to uh, the incidents on March 22nd all of these entries, correct? That is correct. Right. And these, in addition, these were items that were provided to your attorneys as part of discovery, correct? That is correct. And they provided them to you then, correct? Yes. All right. And you've had them in your possession for quite some time, correct? Yes. All right. I want to start with one that... Uh, your attorney did not ask you about, so could you turn to the tab 13? I'm there. All right, and that is an entry titled Desire and Will, correct? Tab 13 is a written confession. Looks like tab oh, 12. Sorry, I was previous tab. Actually, tab 14 is a desire to will if I, maybe I'm not understanding the way okay. it's. Okay, the tab is in front of the okay. entry, yes. not behind yes. it. Okay. All right. Okay, so are we there, desire and will? Yes, we are there. All right, and uh, starting on the first page, uh, it would be the, it's, a 
partial paragraph under where it says DOJ 2530. Do you see that? Uh, the paragraph starts as curious. Yes. All right. Uh, the last sentence in that paragraph reads as follows, does it not? Put in a clear way, need aims to possess, in desire aims to give, while erotic desire aims to share or partake. Correct? Correct. All right. Turn to the next page in that. Uh, it'd be the first full sentence on that uh, starts with love. Do you see where I'm at? There's a partial sentence and then a sentence that begins love becomes. Do you see that? One moment, please. Right at the top of page 41. Yes. All right. Uh, that sentence reads, love becomes love of the infinite. That is the good, and the G in good is capitalized, correct? Correct. And then uh, continues, the next sentence reads, love and do as you desire becomes a principle of excellent morality, correct? Correct. All right. Skipping down a little bit uh, to uh, the uh, paragraph directly under DOJ 2531, uh, the first full sentence of that paragraph uh, starts with love and do as you desire. Do you see that? DOJ 2531? Yes. The first sentence. First full sentence. Starts with desire. Love and do as you desire. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Uh, the next sentence after that, love and do as you desire. Do you see that? Yes. All right. That sentence reads, love and do as you desire transforms into infinite obligation. It says if you actually love, you'll give and give, no matter what your love asks for, that is your desire, correct? Correct. And actually, could you turn to the actual written uh, portion of that, which would be the last page uh, of tab 13. That actually isn't quite accurately transcribed, isn't it? That uh, paragraph actually says, love and do as you desire transforms into infinite obligation. It says if you actually love, you will give and give and give. So there's three gives, is there not? Yes. All right. So there, at least, the transcription is not actually 100% accurate, is it? No, they're missing one give. All right. And then, finally, as it relates to that particular journal entry, uh, let's move down towards uh, the end of the next paragraph. It'd be three lines up from the bottom. Do you see? Uh, a sentence that starts with here, it's right at the end of the, that third from the bottom line of that paragraph. Are First. You, I'm sorry, excuse me, Mr. DeBruyne. It's the paragraph right after the one that we just talked about. Are you saying all self-love, are you speaking of the one that says all self-love is shaken? No, no, we're at the... Uh, in, in the uh, paragraph right below the one that I just quoted from, okay? And three lines up from the bottom of that paragraph, it says here. Do you see that right at the end of the, right at the, end of the line? If I can approach, Your Honor, I can Yes, still... please. You may approach. Thank you. We're speaking of 2531, yes. Right. So... Right oh, there. thank you. Not trying to trick you. No. All right. So that sentence reads, here the phrase becomes a challenge to give up both selfish need and selfless desire so that a future can become, correct? Correct. And the phrase that's being referred to is love and do as you will, correct? Yes, it seems so. Now, you also, 
testified that Alex talked about cannibalism as having something to do with taking away someone's power. Do you recall that? Yes, it was something we talked about during conversation. There is never a reference to that in these in any of the journal entries that we have here, is there? I don't exactly remember, but it is something we spoke about. I, my, that, my question is, isn't if you spoke about it. My question is, there is never a single entry in any of these journal essays that refers to cannibalism as a way to take the power of someone else, is there? I cannot give an exact answer, but I don't believe from my memory, no, I don't remember. And you also talked about it in terms of uh, cannibalism as a way to uh, keep a lover with you after death, uh, to paraphrase what your testimony was. Can you point, you can't point to a single spot in these journals where Alex says that either, can you? No, it's not in the journals, it was during conversation. It's not in the journals, correct? That is correct. And just so that I have it clear in my mind, uh, the first time you actually talked to Alex was in a bar, correct? That is correct. All right. And you had seen him writing in his journal, correct? Yes. And at that point in time, he uh, shared his writings with you, correct? That is correct. And so the first writing he shared with you when he's first meeting you in a bar was related to cannibalism. That is correct. Okay. Let's turn to... Uh, the item uh, dead to me. It's in the first uh, set of tabs, tab number two. And again, remember the tab is before the entry, not after. Thank you. All right. Are you there? Yes. All right. Uh, now you read a uh, portion of uh, the first or the last paragraph on that page uh, that starts with, because you are dead to me. Do you recall that? You said tab two? Tab two of the first section. There's two sets of tab yes. numbers. I'm sorry. Right. Yes. It's a little confusing, I understand. All right. So we're on dead to me, right? Yes, we are on okay. dead to me. All right. And so that last paragraph, uh, you read that first sentence which says, because you are dead to me, this love fails to be truly erotic now, uh, though it may have been, instead we are speaking of cannibalism, correct? You read that? Yes. All right. The next sentence actually reads then, the you I loved was consumed by me, incorporated back into a flesh heterogeneous to itself, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, and obviously, earlier in that same uh, passage, he's talking about the person still being clearly alive, correct? Yes. So he is not talking about cannibalism in any actual sense, is he, correct? No, at this point it is philosophical, yes. It's a metaphoric sense, correct? Yes. And there is not a single entry in there where Alec, in that particular essay, where Alex talks about consuming another individual literally, correct? Correct. You turn to, it will be again in that first section of tabs, tab five. Violation? Yes. Are you there? Correct. I am there. Okay. When you're ready, let me know. Sorry. Sure. Ready, counsel? 
Yes. All right. Uh, in that uh, section, uh, which you talked about, uh, a portion of it, uh, he also writes, and this would be in the third paragraph, the last two sentences of that third paragraph, uh, he states, so I gave myself to you to attempt a healing love. Such an act is doomed from the start, correct? Correct. So he's indicating that his love is attempting to heal, correct? I believe so. That's what it says, right? Yes. Thank you. Let's move to, this would be uh, the second set of tabs, tab one. Extra scriber. It should yeah. be come as you are, flaws and all. That is correct. All right. You ready, counsel? Yes. All right. Uh, in that, in the last paragraph there, uh, the start of that paragraph states, only by you coming naked to my call, essentially my being naked first, can love fully be erotic, correct? Correct. So essentially he's saying that both parties to the relationship need to be naked to the other to expose their own flaws, correct? Correct. And you move to t the next tab, tab two of the second section. And, uh, my Latin is not very good, so I'm not going to even try to pronounce that. But let's start with... Going to the second page of the typed portion of it, you read that first sentence about him be those first two sentences about him being afraid. Uh, yes. The rest of that paragraph, uh, besides those first two sentences, reads, "Afraid I will use someone for redemption and self mutilation, but I will love." I will love myself, forgive myself, and love you anyways. I am no longer myself. I don't know who I am. So let me apologize and forgive myself for becoming something new. Correct. And in the next paragraph, he talks, actually, never mind that. Uh, let's go back to the first page. The second paragraph, the last sentence of that second paragraph uh, states, I really do love you, but I am unworthy, correct? I'm sorry, I don't see where that is. That's the I, second paragraph. Second paragraph. On the first page or the last second page? On the first page of that uh, journal entry, first typewritten page, second paragraph. It's a paragraph that starts, this is old advice. Do you see that? Yes. All right. And the last sentence of that reads, I really do love you, but I am unworthy. Correct? Correct. And you read a portion of the fourth paragraph there where that starts, I have half-heartedly. The sentence after the portion you read uh, reads, yet I love you, correct? Correct. And then moving down uh, to the second full paragraph under DOJ 2483, the first sentence of that reads, 
My gratitude is that my fear of myself taught me to love more than I am allowed to. Correct? Correct. And then continuing to the second last line of that same paragraph, uh, the first sentence of that line reads, I could follow you in your footsteps and give my life for whoever needed it. Correct? Correct. Again, he's talking about giving his life for the one he loves, correct? I can't say that, no. Well, it says, I could follow in your footsteps and give my life for whoever needed it, correct? Correct. Would you turn to tab four in that section? That's from the past memories? Yes. All right. Now you read a uh, part in there where it, uh, uh, in the be the first full paragraph under 2485, uh, the paragraph that starts in the face of all my anxiety. Do you recall reading the part that started with, I know you wanted to change me? Do you recall reading that? Yes. All right. Immediately after the part that you read, is it not true that he writes, quote, I was too Hegelian, or I call it such now, you were my master, correct? Correct. Indicating that the one he's talking about, the love he's talking about was his master, not the other way around, correct? Yes, he wrote that. Could you turn to tab seven? When I lost myself? Yes. That's another one that you read something of right at the very end of that uh, passage. I want to talk about uh, on the first page of that passage, uh, do you see it would be the first full paragraph under DOJ 2504, uh, the paragraph that starts, this is a naive result. Are you at that paragraph? Yes, I am. All right. The last sentence of that paragraph reads, in committing to a set of values, one formulates a naive ideal that one resolves, even if weakly, to strive toward. Correct? Correct. And going back to the last page of that uh, section, or the page that you had read something from. Uh, I'm sorry, what page are you on? We're on page, it's marked as page 30. I want to have you take a look at, uh, under DOJ 2507, uh, the last two lines of that, and then the part of the first two lines of the next page, which is DOJ 2508. So page, it starts with, I've recently fallen. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Uh, and that reads, I've recently fallen for a young man who is in a rather unhealthy relationship. I don't believe that I am doing evil. I suspect that I might even be doing good. But this means that even if only the former holds, I can really do whatever I will, so long as that is not evil. Correct? Yes. Would you turn to the next tab, tab eight of that section, uh, titled Between Love and Obligation? Yes. You there? Yes, I am. All right. In the second 
paragraph. You had read the first sentence of that. Uh, move down about a few lines. It'd be the fourth line from the bottom. Do you see where it starts? Do as you will. Yes. Oh, all right. And do as you will. It reads, do as you will, so long as you love, which gives far less freedom, as one cannot do anything when one loves, and love can cause quite limiting obligations, correct? Yes. And continuing down a little ways uh, under DOJ 2512, uh, it'd be the first full paragraph under there, uh, the third line down, do you see where it starts, do as you will? Yes. All right, it reads, do as, we, do as you will, yes, but there are things you also ought do regardless of whether or not you want to, correct? Correct. And then finally on that, uh, in the second last line on that page, uh, it reads, you love, so I ought not abuse, correct? Yes. Let's move to the next tab. Uh, another entry that you didn't, your counsel did not have you reference, but that's the one titled Letting It Be. Yes. Right. Uh, the third paragraph under there, the start of it reads, that something is permissible does not mean one ought to do it, merely that one may. Correct? Correct. Let's move to tab 21. <coughs> tab uh, entitled Between Two Hands. Yes. All right. Uh, in the portion that you read, uh, Alex writes that there is a, uh, writes as if he has a severely damaged hand, correct? That is correct. He does not, in fact, have a severely damaged hand, does he? I only know what he described to me about his hand. He does not have a severely damaged hand, correct? I can't say that, no. Right. I'm, I'm not a doctor. Well, he was able to use both his right and his left hand, correct? Yes. Never saw him have difficulty using either his right or his left hand to do something, correct? He was just describing to me the feelings about his hand. That is correct. You, you never saw him have difficulty using either his right or his left hand, correct? I cannot remember that, no. I'm sorry? I can't remember that specifically, no. You can't remember that he had difficulty or that he didn't have difficulty? Yes. Let's move finally to another one that your counsel did not ask you about, which would be the 25th uh, tab on that page titled Authors and Others. Yes. All right. This is the uh, tab immediately after the one uh, titled Faith and Flesh, correct? That is correct. And take a look at the second paragraph of that uh, entry. Uh, the second line down, you see where it starts, the author of Flesh and Faith? Yes. All right. Uh, that reads uh, from there to the end of that paragraph, the author of Flesh and Faith believe that to have any value or any worth at all, they must possess self-hatred as to willingly kill themselves for the sake of any other. Their notion of love was such that being loved was a detriment to their lovability. The final sentences show this clearly. Being loved for them is absolute proof that they are incapable of loving 
or being worthy of love. Now I cannot help but think their view is untenable because they can only be good in so far as they are the soul guilty as far as they will ever know. For meeting another lover damns the whole project to failure, correct? Correct. And uh, moving to the next page, uh, the first full paragraph under DOJ 2566 starts, I love you all, each and every author, reader, writer, you. Know that whatever becomes of me for this unconclusive postscript is my suicide note. It will only be found post-mortem, correct? Correct. And then finally, he concludes this entry with, quote, always prefer life and never stop affirming survival. I love you and I'm smiling at you from wherever I am, correct? Correct. Now, when you talk to Detective Proc on March 23rd, 2018, you did not once mention these journals to Detective Proc, correct? I was answering his questions to the best of my ability at that time, but no, I did not. You did not mention these journals to Detective Proc on March 23rd, correct? No. And you did not mention these journals to Detective Proc on December on March 24th either, did you? No. You also never once told Detective Proc on March 23rd anything about Alex and cannibalism, correct? I don't have independent strong memories about that conversation, but I if I've seen the transcript and no I have not. And you never once on March 24th mentioned anything about cannibalism to Detective Proc, correct? That is correct. All right. Now you in your you were on the stand yesterday you said that Alex told you that he was going to have you one more time, correct? That is correct. Right. However, when you talked to Detective Proc on uh, May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Counsel, we're going to be on page 61 of Exhibit 290. Detective Proc asked you, okay, was it any time? We, we don't have it yet. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Are you ready? Let me know. We're starting at line uh, 2749. 21, I'm sorry, 2749. 49. Thank you. You ready? Yes. Okay. It says, uh, Detective Proc asks, okay, was it any time during your guys' conversation their talk about sex today or sex that day, about him wanting to have sex with you or you wanting to have sex with him. Your response is, no, I didn't want to have sex at all. Question, did he answer, I don't think so. Question, why did he have the knife and why and to cut your pants? And your answer was, I think he just wanted to look at me, correct? I was answering the questions to the best of my ability at that time for Proc. But yes, that, I don't... I read that accurately, correct? Yes, yes. I don't dispute that, no. So you never told Detective Proc in that interview that Alex wanted to have sex with you one more time, did you? In that interview, no, I did not. When you met... Uh, when you went to Mr. Sipple's residence and he asked you, based on the uh, 911 operator's request, what happened, you told him you could not remember, correct? I could not remember, yes. That's what you told him, correct? Yes, I could not remember at that time. 
You told Joan, Joe Wayne that you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes, I could not remember at that time. You, you told Joe Wayne that you could not remember what happened, correct? That is correct. You told the tep Deputy Shields that you could not remember what happened, correct? Correct. You told Officer Reeves you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes, I could not remember. You told Officer Reeves you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes. You told the first nurse at the hospital that you met that you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes. You told Dr. Tillotson you could not remember what happened, correct? Which doctor was Dr. Tillotson again, Dr. Please. Tillotson was the one who testified in court. Yes. You told Jennifer Morris you could not remember what happened, correct? At that time, I don't have strong memories of who I talked to, but yes, I could not remember at that time. You told Jennifer Morris you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes. You told Kelly Swartos you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes. You told Detective Proc on March 23rd you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes. And until Detective Proc confronted you about finding the car on that, at the end of that mud road, you told Detective Proc on March 24th you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes. And then after Detective Proc confronted you with that, you told him what happened, correct? I didn't believe he was confronting me, but I started to tell him what had happened. Yes. I didn't ask for an explanation. I asked you, you told Detective Proc after he confronted you what you claim happened, correct? I told him what had happened to me, yes. And in that same interview, you told Detective Proc you could not get it out of your head what happened, correct? I couldn't get the fragmented images, the smells, the feelings out of my head, yes. But I, yes, I did say I could not remember or get it out of my head. Okay, this looks like just a good spot. Just take it. Time out, please. Okay, Madam Clerk, or Reporter, we're not getting real time. I don't know if you have, you can, it's something we can troubleshoot quick. Okay, so that would be with the Yeah, I can do that Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, continue. So line 2499, you stated because it was just, because it just was scary and I can't get out of my head, correct? Correct. All right. And 
Detective Proc says no, and we're sorry that you went through this, and then you respond, and it just keeps replaying and replaying and replaying, and I wish it would go away, correct? Correct. And you did not admit to Detective Proc that you cut boy in your arm until he confronted you with the fact that the wording and the way it was oriented did not make sense, correct? Yes. You told Officer Reeves that the incident happened in Owen Park, correct? I don't remember speaking very much with Officer Reeves. Right. Well, and if Officer Reeves testified that you told him it happened in Owen Park, you have no reason to dispute that, do you? No. Right. And you told uh, the nurse at the hospital that it happened in Owen Park, correct? If it's in the transcript, then yes. And you told Ms. Swartos uh, Kelly Swarto said it happened in Owen Park, correct? I would have to refresh my memory from the transcript. Nothing actually happened in Owen Park on March 22nd with Alex Woodworth, did it? That's correct. You never, in fact, even went to Owen Park with Alex on March 22nd, did you? That's correct. And when you told these people that it happened at Owen Park, you knew that nothing had happened at Owen Park, didn't you? At that time, everything was a mess. Yes or no, ma'am? Objection. She has a right to answer the question, which you remember. The, the question, okay. me, if no. she can't, if you can't answer the question yes or no, then indicate it. I can't answer the question yes or no. All right. And then you have to answer it how you can answer it. Okay. Thank you. I can't answer yes or no to okay. that question. That's fine. And you agree that when you talked to Detective Proc on March 24th of, actually, let's just do it this way. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Page 32, Council, uh, starting at line 1439, <coughs> Exhibit 270. 270, okay, please. Page 32. 27. No, this is 290. This is 270. Or 290. I'm sorry. That's Thank my fault. You. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no worries. What, what page number? 32. Starting at 1439. Ready? Yes. In that interview, Detective Proc asks you, okay, and where was the knife now after he carved that in your arm? Answer, I think he put it in his pocket or he kept it or had it by him, but I don't remember, correct? Correct. But you knew that you had the knife and had taken the knife and left it in the ditch at, near Mr. Sipple's house, correct? Yes, I was answering his questions to the best of my ability at the time. Well, in fact, later in that interview, you admit that you would let, drop the knife in the ditch somewhere, correct? Yes. You told uh, Officer Reeves that you went to Racy's first on March 
uh, 22nd before you went to Alex's residence, correct? Judge, uh, this was reviewed yesterday. We're okay. Officer, so that's I, I may have. I, I, if I if I asked it already, I will not. Very well. Go ahead and move on. That's fine. I'll just continue with another area. <coughs> Ma'am, when you met with Detective Proc on March 23rd, 2018, you knew you were safe, correct? Yes. And when you met with Detective Proc on March 24th, 2018, you knew you were safe, correct? Yes, I knew I was safe. And you had met with Detective Proc before those two dates, correct? Yes. They met with him, in fact, on March 1st of 2018, correct? Yes. And talked to him about the John Hansen situation, correct? That is correct. And you answered all of his questions that he asked you about the John Hansen situation, correct? Yes. With no problems, correct? Yes. Yet on March 23rd, 2018, you told Detective Proc you could not remember anything about what happened on March 22nd after you left Alex Woodworth's residence, correct? The interviews, the 23rd and the 24th for me are one interview. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the start of those interview, that one interview now that you consider it as, uh, actually, let's put it this way. You were in court when uh, we played those two interviews, correct? Correct. All right. And in the first one, which we played uh, just before the end of a day, you recall that you told Detective Proc repeatedly in that you could not remember what happened after you left Alex's residence, correct? Correct. Right. And you were present when uh, we played uh, the next day with Detective Proc the interview of March 24th, correct? Yes. And you agree that you repeatedly, again, until Detective Proc confronted you about finding the car, told Detective Proc you couldn't remember what happened, correct? I wasn't Judge, ready. this is repetitive. This question has been asked and answered numerous times already. I don't recall the specific question. Perhaps it has been, but I mean, again, because of the not finishing in one day, I'm going to give a little latitude, so go ahead and you can answer that question if you can. Overruled. And at that point in time when you... Uh, Mr. DeFore, Talk to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could you repeat the question for me? I thought it was answered already, so... Oh, it wasn't? Okay. Uh, on March 24th, until Detective Proc confronted you about finding the car, you repeatedly told him you could not remember what happened, correct? Yes, I had said that. And what you and Detective Proc eventually asked you, you know, why didn't you tell me about what happened? Correct. Would it be all right if I seen the transcript? All right, we'll get there. Yep. Okay, Fifty-five. All right, may I approach, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. Page 55, line 2491, starting at 2491. Judge, I hate to interrupt counsel, but I, I just, he's done exactly the same part before me. If you want to let him do it again, it's okay, but I just wanted to point out. I'm not, is this a different section? I'm not asking. You're going through a different section? Oh, of page 55. Oh, I'm sorry, what line number? 2491. Oh, okay. Ready? So starting at 2491, Detective Proc, and you're just now, how come you didn't tell me this yesterday when we talked, Ezra? Answer, because I didn't. It was, it's too scary, correct? Correct. And Ms. McCandless, what's too scary is that you knew if you told the truth about what happened that you'd be in fact charged with killing Alex. Isn't that correct? That is not correct. Thank you. I don't have any other questions.
Okay. Make fun, so I read a rec. Can we have the short break, please? All right, we'll take a 10 minute recess. Excuse the jury. Uh, after morning break, it's uh, 10 06 a.m. Um, Mr. Nelson, uh, go ahead. Judge, I understand this is from uh, Ms. Vishnu's uh, witness in the sense that she's been conducting the direct exam. However, I am. Uh, plan is for me to do the closing argument and so uh, exhibit 697 which is the blue two ring binder regarding the journals obviously that has been entered into evidence there's been talk by both in direct and redirect or excuse me direct and cross regarding certain entries in the journal what I want to know from an evidentiary standpoint is since exhibit 2 697 is into evidence other than the March 1st entry which we all agree is not part of that does the witness now need to make specific reference to a line for either side to make reference to a writing that's in that journal that's already mar been marked in evidence or since it's already in evidence do we need to go through line by line and have a witness read each line that we want to make reference to in closing. That's my evidentiary question. I understand that the state think has a position that we need to go through every line, and I'll let Mr. DeFore speak to that. But it was that's our that's my question because that's going to control what and how much we do and redirect. If that makes sense. Well, it does to, to some extent, but I'm not sure I you know understand the whole question. So, Mr. DeFore, Your Honor, essentially, uh, counsel wants to know if he can basically rebut what my cross examination is in closing by referencing portions of the journals that have not been read to the jury and shown to the jury, uh, and or shown to the jury. And my position is it's the same as any of these other extensive exhibits. I mean, for example, all of the texts between. Uh, the defendant and uh, Alex Woodworth have been admitted. They're part of an exhibit that's been admitted, but the court has said no. We, you know, we only talk about. You know, you can only discuss, and the only parts that are really in front of the jury are those portions that have been referred to. The same with uh, Instagram. I mean, we've got a 400, and, you know, 568-page exhibit, Exhibit 420, uh, that has Instagram exchanges. Uh, you know, involving the defendant. Uh, but again, the court has said, no, only the ones that have been referred to are part of the record that can be referred to in closing. It should be the same with this. If counsel is able to do that, essentially it allows them to uh, do redirect without giving me a chance to recross, and that's not appropriate. All right. All right. Well, in uh, fairness, and again, uh, again, counsel, Mr. Nelson, Please turn your microphone on if you want to respond to that. Um, yes, Judge, just briefly, I certainly appreciate that uh, there are other exhibits that um, there's been limited rulings as far as the content of those exhibits. However, I, my understanding of Ms. McCandless's testimony is that she testified that the table of contents regarding Exhibit 697, she had knowledge and awareness of all of the writings that are listed here other than uh, the one from March 1st of 2018. So there is evidence in the record without her having read it that she's essentially aware and has knowledge of all of these items. And the question then is, do you have to read each one of those items? Because her, again, that, that's my understanding of what her testimony was is she had knowledge and awareness of all of those writings. I don't, ex I don't expect to stand up in my closing and talk about these journals we've probably I just want to make sure that we're not limited in a way well here's a how I see it is that that pretrial order was entered in order to make sure that again that we boil it down to what you're actually intended to use so the state can reasonably respond to that um, and uh, if it you know again with these larger exhibits there's uh, so much information that hasn't been brought to the attention of the jury. And I think it would be, particularly in this circumstance, it would be unfair to the state to refer to uh, passages or writings in those uh, journals that uh, Mr. DeFore has not had a chance to, I guess, recross on if you bring it back on redirect. Um, 
So, again, each party was given, you know, an amount of time. Nobody's exceeded that time, but uh, certainly anything outside of what has been uh, given to the state in terms of what you intend to use from those exhibits. So I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm answering your question. I don't know if I'm, it might be on my end as well, Judge. And so what, Exhibit 697 is what we intend to use. We've <coughs> entered that, we've offered that, all of those journals are in. We've, Ms. Vishni has referenced certain of those journals, right? And I certainly agree that if that entry itself wasn't entered into, wasn't discussed, that that entry, let's, I'm just randomly saying, and I don't know if this is true or not, but randomly, um, just pick one and do as you will. The number, number one, six, the innocent choice to consume. I don't think anybody talked about that, right? right? And so I don't think that that is something that can be discussed in closing by other side unless it comes up in redirect or recross. However, something like come as you are, flaws and all, that's been discussed. The portions of that have been read to the jury. Not every line of that entry has been led to the jury, read to the jury. So is that entry, the entire entry, under the rule of completeness, something that either side can talk about, or do we have to <coughs> read every word within that entry before we can talk about it? That's my question. It, well, I, I hate to interrupt, go but ahead. I'd like to just point out that there have been plenty of lines that I didn't ask to have read that were shown on the Elmo. Now, I don't know what the jury saw, but I <coughs> didn't have two pieces of paper covering it. So there's certainly, although not been something a court reporter took down, that parts of those actual entries have been shown to the jury even though they weren't talked about. Just like journals of Miss McCandless were shown to the jury. I mean, they were passed around, but I have had it on the Elmo. So we're only talking about specific entries that have been discussed in court. The, the, the entry itself, as opposed to each particular word. That's what I guess, and maybe I'm micromanaging it too much but I think is, it, is my, my question clear well if those if the ex, excerpts that you specifically advise the state were what you intended to use at trial as far as I'm concerned you can use that they're in evidence okay where you have a transcript and you had each had an opportunity to review that um, the state has had an opportunity to cross-examine on that, uh, but I believe that if again, it's in evidence and it's something that uh, so, Mr. Camus is, is aware of. I, I mean, that's the thing. This evidence is only admissible to the extent that no, she was aware of it. Judge, I don't think we're being clear enough. So if if Go you ahead, will allow please. me, I'm just going to take an example. Okay, love and do what you will. Both sides use that essay while Ms. McCandless was testifying, okay? We used it and the state used different portions. Our question is this, when Mr. Nelson gives his closing argument, can he use lines from love and do what you will, that essay that neither I asked about or Mr. DeFore asked about? We're not asking and we don't think it's appropriate to use parts of the journal that nobody asked her about, only the essays that have been asked about in the courtroom. We just need to know, do we need to read, if we, if Mr. Nelson wants to use a line from that, do I have to ask her about it right now on redirect, or can he just talk about that particular essay? Not the whole book. D am I making this more clear? Yeah, it's a little bit more clear. I, okay. I don't have a problem with that, but the state, I think, Yes, Your Honor, that. the state does. Uh, First off, counsel referenced the rule of completeness. That doesn't have anything to do at all with what we're talking about. The rule of completeness just allows one witness or one party to bring in additional parts of a, of a document or a statement uh, that wouldn't otherwise be admissible. That's not what we're dealing with here. Our position is, Your Honor, if it, is, if it has not been specifically referenced, read to, uh, by the you know by counsel uh, in direct or redirect or by me in cross or recross it shouldn't be discussed it shouldn't be mentioned in closing the same as additional text that may be in the same time frame as 
ones that have been referenced. They may even be part of the same text exchange, uh, but if they weren't actually read, they shouldn't be discussed by, uh, by anybody. Uh, if they want to, that, if, if, if the court allows them to then do that, essentially the court is allowing them to have redirect of the defendant without giving me a chance to recross by saying, well, in cross-examination they asked about this, uh, you know, but ladies and gentlemen of the jury during closing, there's also this on that. Well, that doesn't give me a chance to then rebut that with, with the defendant and first off to determine whether that was in her mind at the time uh, and secondly uh, to point out other portions of it uh, except possibly in rebuttal which is you know a much much more limited opportunity to discuss it and especially considering the amount of evidence that there is uh, it would be extremely difficult to be able to effectively respond to that in rebuttal it's easy to do it it's much easier to do it now when they do it on redirect and I have a chance to recross it uh, to deal with it because I have more time to do it. But if you're trying to listen to closing arguments and then trying to read, you know, journal entries at the same time and, you know, find responses to that to give in a, a rebuttal afterwards, that would be extra from the amount of paperwork that there is with this. Uh, that would be extraordinarily difficult and unfair. So uh, we just believe that it's it's an opportunity. They're asking to be able to do redirect without doing redirect and giving me a chance to recross. All right. Well, okay. We're ready so, for you to roll. All right. That's all I want to say. So, so on this, as it, as it relates to, again, the voluminous uh, data extractions from disks, phones, uh, the cloud, all of that, as well as these journal entries, because again, it is, uh, there's an enormous amount. I think that is the only way to manage it, because if there's objections, that this is fact, not an evidence, and so on and so forth, it's gonna make closing arguments messy. So if you do want to, if there are specific journal entries you wanna to refer to in your closing, then you need to take them up on redirect, if you haven't already. All right, thank you. Okay. 